praise the Lord to tell of all you've done, of how you changed my life and walked away the path. I want to shout it out from every rooftop sing, for now I know that God is for me, not against me. I could sing. Well, now I know that God is for me, not against me. I could sing an ending song of how you saved my soul. I could dance a thousand miles because of your command. One more time, say, I could sing. Cause we're so happy in you, Jesus Everybody's dancing Cause we're free If only we could see your face See you smile over us Unseen angels celebrate Joy is in this place
Taylor, to tell them all you've done Of how you changed my life and wiped away the past I want to shout it out from every rooftop scene For now I know that God is for me, not against me
bless you, Jesus. I grew up on this song. I just figured out what it meant. To take something that's worthless, like the Lord took all of us, I've been redeemed. A lot of times in the revival, we sing these old songs, and all of you folks who grew up in church, when we say, I'm redeemed, they understand what that means. But in this service tonight, we've got a lot of folks who have just come to know the Lord in the last few weeks. When you say redeemed, they go, what does that mean? Well, I tell you what that means, a much deeper meaning of that, but here's a simple man's idea of what redeemed is. Several years ago, you could go to the grocery store and they'd give you green stamps. Anybody ever had those? Those green stamps are useless unless you lick them and stick them in this little green stamp book. And they don't have them anymore, but they used to have S&H green stamp stores. How many of you ladies know what I'm talking about? So you used to take your book in there, those useless pieces of paper, and you would trade those stamps that they gave you as a bonus for how much groceries you had bought. And you could buy mixers and hair dryers, and, but you had to have a lot of books to do it. Well, I may be oversimplifying, and I, I, again, I apologize to all you theologians if I've offended your mind. But for those of us who are just simple every day and we just love Jesus, the Lord took me, who was worthless, and he covered me with his blood and washed me clean. And he wrote my name in a book. And he took something that was worthless and put himself into it and made me a son of God. And I thank you, Lord. I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed. It's a little different version than my grandmother sang, but it's the same song. Sweet is the song I'm singing today. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. Trouble and sorrow has vanished away. Cause I have been, I have been redeemed. Sing with me, come on. I'm redeemed by love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine. All to Him I now resign. Because I have been, I have been, I have been redeemed. Great is my joy, now as onward I go. I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed, all the way homeward, my praises shall flow, cause I have been, I, can we take that up, I like this one, precious indeed, is my savior to me, cause I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed, Happy and glory, someday I shall be. Thank you, Lord, because I have been, I have been redeemed. Come on, lift up your voice and say, I'm redeemed. My love divine. Glory, glory. Glory, glory. Christ is mine. All to him I now reside. Because I have been, come on, say it.
and sweet is the song I'm singing today. I'm redeemed, yes I am, I believe. All trouble and sorrow has vanished away. Ever since I have been, I have been redeemed. time when I get to that last I have been and you go I have been real I want us to make these lights move all right all right here we go I'm redeemed sing with by love divine glory glory Christ is mine glory glory Christ is mine all to him all to him I now resign I now resign I have been I have been. here we go I have been take it up come on Come on, sing. I love the divine. Glory, glory. Christ is mine. All to him. Ah, come on now, lift up your voice. I have been. I have been. I have been. Really. You see, once my life didn't count for anything. But when Jesus came into my heart, I have been, I have been redeemed. Now you have to excuse me. Because the Lord Jesus took away the sorrow and replaced it with joy. And he turned my mourning into dancing. And I have been, I have been redeemed. I can tell you're not used to this. So just take your time a minute. And the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say, so I have been, I have been. Do it again. Now do it loud. Come on. I have been. I have been yeah. Somebody here tonight, all day long, the devil's been telling you you're not saved. Let's do it again. I have been. I'll move on to something slow in a minute, but I want to say, I receive your everlasting love for me. I receive your everlasting love for me. I receive it, Jesus. I receive your everlasting love for me. Yes, I do. I receive your everlasting love for me. Nothing I can say, I can say will take your love away. No place 
I can go, I can go where your love won't be there. Nothing I can do, I can do will make you love me more. Your love comes as a gift, as a gift, and I only have to open it. Your everlasting love. Oh, yes, I do. I receive your everlasting love. I receive it. I receive your everlasting love. I love this. Nothing I can say. I can say. Will take your love away. Thank you, Lord. And there's no place I can go. I can go where your love won't be there. Jesus. And nothing I can do. I can do will make you love me more. Because your love comes as a gift. As a gift. And I don't deserve it, I didn't earn it, but all I have to do is open it and not. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I receive your love for me. Yes, I do. I receive your love for me. I receive it. Yes, I do, Lord. I receive it. I receive your love for me. Oh, yes, I do, Lord. I receive your love for me. Oh, I receive all that you have, Jesus. I receive your love for me. Oh, I want more and more and more and more of you, Jesus. I receive your love for me. Oh, yes, I do. I'm hungry, Lord. I receive your love for me. I do. I receive your love for me. Oh, your everlasting love. 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 Oh, you're everywhere I go, Lord. You're everywhere I see. Oh, you're everywhere, Lord. I worship you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for your patience and mercy. Oh, and your love that endures forever, that reaches to the highest heights and to the lowest hell. Oh, your love, oh God, Far beyond what pen or tongue could ever tell. Oh, sweet Jesus. Oh, sweet Jesus. Sweetest name I know. Sweetest name I know. Sweetest name I know. Sweetest name.
sweet Jesus, we praise you, Lord. Oh, the name of Jesus is lifted high. In those times when you don't know what to pray, all you have to know how to say is Jesus, Jesus, in a shouted voice or a whispered tone, in a crowded room or when you're all alone, it's Jesus, 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 I love the name of Jesus, every day it's the same, Jesus. He's the lover of my soul, yes, yeah. Jesus, there's power in the name of Jesus. My life is forever changed because of Jesus, my Savior and my Lord. Can we say his name again? Come on. I love you, Jesus. Jesus, how I love the day. How I love the day of Jesus. Every day, every day the same. It's Jesus, the lover. He's the lover of my soul. There's power in the name of Jesus. My life's forever changed. Jesus, you're my Savior and my Lord. Oh, yes, you are. If you're in this place tonight and you're not a Christian and you don't know how to pray, all you have to know how to say is call on Jesus. In the midnight hour of your life, call on Jesus. If you're shouting, or your whispered in tone in a great big crowded room like this one or tonight at home when you're alone call on Jesus there's power in his name Jesus say his name oh see Jesus how I love the name of Jesus every day same Jesus he's the lover of my soul oh I love you Lord Jesus there's power in the name of Jesus I'll never be the same because of Jesus I want you to lift your voice and praise his name. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Jesus, how I love the name of Jesus. Every day, every day the same. It's Jesus, the lover. He's the lover of my soul. Oh, see, 
your voice, let's praise Him. Lift up your voice and praise Him. Oh, Lord, we glory in You. We glory in You. What wonderful things Your hand has brought to us, O oh Lord. Come on, lift it high to him. In the balcony, in the overflow rooms, everywhere. Lift your voice. If you've never sang to the Lord, do it now. Come on, jump in. Hallelujah.
service. Let's stay here a while. Come on, worship him. Worship him. I believe the heavens are open tonight. If you need something from the Lord, you need healing in your body. I feel like the Lord wants to heal some people of cancer in this place tonight. I believe God wants to set some people free from fear. In the name of Jesus, we praise you, oh Lord. We glorify you. Lord, we enter into your presence, Lord. And Lord, we've come here as broken people. 
We've come here as hungry people, Lord. We've come here as people in need of healing. Lord, there are people in this place tonight that need emotional healing, that they've been abused and bruised and torn, and Satan has desired to beat them up and ruin their lives. But, oh, Lord, in your presence is joy. And, Lord, I ask that as this service progresses, and as our hearts, Lord, are turned to you with everything we have, that you would let your glory begin to fall in, in this place to a greater degree than we've ever known, Lord. We thank you for this revival that you've set. But, Lord, it's not enough. We want more of you. We want more of you, Lord. We want more of you. 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 We want to run after you, Lord. We want to run after you, Lord. We want to run after you, run after you. From this night forward, Lord, let, let us hear testimonies of people that have been in your presence tonight, and their lives are never the same. And let your glory go from this place into the world. In Jesus' name. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Just tell him you love him. Hallelujah. 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 We love you, Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, in the last recent years, uh, you may be seated. A lot of a lot has been said in the last recent years about renewal. And by renewal, uh, my understanding of what uh, is meant by that—that uh, some new music is introduced, and and maybe some new York worship forms and so forth have been introduced, but. Um, we're not into renewal here. Uh, we're into revival, which goes much deeper than that. Renewal principally is a bless me uh, type situation the way I understand it. I may mis misread it, but uh, we're, we're, we want to be blessed. But the problem with our blessings have been that we've, we've been blessed in the past and, and we've jumped and shouted and when we hit the ground, we didn't walk right. But revival, what, what's happening here now is that we're jumping and shouting just like we did, we did in renewal. But when we're, we, we come down, we're walking right. And you see what God's doing right now is he's taking an Eli's son's generation. And that's what the church was. We, we had our finger in God's pot. And if you, don't, if you want to read the story, you can go to the Old Testament and look it up. I don't know the Scripture reference right off the top of my head. But Eli's two sons were the natural uh, inheritors of Eli's position. But uh, these boys were dabbling in religion, and they, were, they had their hand in God's uh, glory. And God rejected them and, and raised up a Samuel. And, uh, friend, I'm going to tell you what God's doing in revival is he's raising up a Samuel generation. And this generation is that generation. You and I have a privilege of being a part of that. And uh, all God's asking us to do is just shake ourselves out of our slumber and say, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Just speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. And God's speaking. He's speaking in very clarion tones. And he's calling on the church to clean it up. And that's what's happening in revival, friend. I was raised on a two-mule farm over in Mississippi. And uh, every spring, my dad would get out a plow and hitch an old gray mule to it, and that plow was called a turning plow. It was a braking plow. And the purpose of that was to, to go through the, the, the fields that had lain dormant since the, the harvest back in the fall and to break that, uh, that ground up and turn it over. See, the ground had hardened through the winter, and sometimes it had frozen. It had been packed down by the rains and, and whatever. And, uh, th but that, that turning plow, that breaking plow, would go into that soil and would turn it over, and, and that soil would become just as, it, it would become like uh, silt in your hands. And uh, it, it, was, it was no longer hard, but it was, it was um, uh, ready to receive seed. And that's what God's doing in revival to our hearts. He just put the plow in. He's breaking that fallow ground. He's plowing very deeply. And our hearts are becoming pliable. Our hearts are becoming receptive to the seed of God's repentant message. And uh, this repentant message, friend, is good anywhere in the world. It's good anywhere in the world. Someone asked uh, our evangelist, can you preach this repentance message in some European country? Friend, I'm, I'm here to tell you, you can preach this message in any country in the world. The world is ready to repent. They're sick and tired of half-hearted, lukewarm, 
in and out, up and down, lazy, lackadaisical, lukewarm religion. The world is ready for the real thing. And this message has been preached. I've preached it, and others have preached it. I've preached it in Switzerland. I've preached it in France. I've preached it in Australia. I've preached it in Canada. And I don't know how many uh, 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 states in this union that I've preached the, the repentance message uh, since this revival has begun. And it has been received every place we preached it. It has not been rejected. Mike Brown and, and Lila Trahune preceded me down to Australia, and they broke up the ground. And, uh, and I came in and broke it up some more. They plowed with the plow, and I came in with a disc and uh, sowed some seed. And I'm telling you folks from Australia, uh, what, what happened in that ab uh, uh, aboriginal church is going to sweep the continent of Australia. You watch. And it's going to be a quick work, friend. This thing's getting ready to happen in Australia. And it's not only in Australia, but Europe as well, in England. And uh, South, of South America, South America's about to receive another wave of God's glory. I'm telling you, friend, this thing is going to be, the world is going to be ablaze with revival. And you know what? When the world's ablaze with revival, the trumpet's going to sound. Hallelujah. And the dead's going to raise. Hallelujah. The most exciting place to be when the trumpet sounds is in a graveyard. When you see those, those people coming out of the grave, you know in just a few minutes, if you're right, gravity is going to lose its hold on you, friend. <laughs> Hallelujah. So here's what it's going to be like. If you're standing in a graveyard, imagine being at a funeral. And you're there, and the trump of God sounds. And all at once, you look over, and people are coming. I don't know whether they're going to turn the tombstones over, whether the ground's going to be disturbed. I have an idea they're just going to come out because the body's going to be changed. Like Jesus, you know, he went right through the wall. Remember when he did that with the, the disciples? First thing he said was peace. Brother, if I'd have been in that room, that's what I'd want to heard too. A guy comes through the wall, I want to hear peace. And so, you know, I, these, these bodies are just going to come right up through the dirt probably. And, and you know, when, when you, if you're there and you see that, you're going to start jumping up and down. And on one of those uh, up jumps, you're not coming down. You're going straight on up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Friend, this is the time to get it right. If there's any sin in your life in a few minutes, you're going to have the wonderful opportunity to come down and get that out of the way. And it, what do you want that garbage in your life for when you can have peace and joy and be clean and God can live and move through your life with great joy and great glory? Friend, this is the time to get in the river. Don't be hesitant. Don't try to figure things out. Just experience what God is doing. You've already discerned that this is the Spirit of God. This thing could not have gone on going into the third year if this was not God. The devil doesn't do the kind of things that are going on here, friends. People are being saved. Their lives are transformed. Marriages are being put back together. Uh, derelicts are being, being uh, turned into productive citizens. Just, you know, the devil doesn't do those kinds of things. He doesn't sober people up, and he doesn't take addicts and turn them into saints. The devil doesn't do that. He destroys life. Jesus saves lives, and there's lives being saved here, friend. There are hundreds of them in this room that have been saved, transformed right here. Your spirit bears witness with that. Just get in and let God, instead of uh, seeing how-tos, just let God begin to work in your life and you experience the anointing of God and the blessing of God. If there's anything in your life that needs to be, be straightened out, get it squared away. Don't be defensive. Just, God knows about it anyway. You know about it. Come clean. Get it out of the way when the altar call's given and all of heaven will come down in your soul. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Well, let's give God one more uh, hand of applause just to praise Him. Jesus, we praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Oh, I bless your name, Jesus. Oh, I bless your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Woo! Hallelujah! Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Jesus, Lord. Woo! Jesus is the reason. Hallelujah. Jesse Bader Ralph from Bay City, Texas.
Bay City, Texas. Yeah. All right. Well, what's God done for you? Oh, he's done a lot for me. He pulled me off the streets. I was in gangs. I was lost. And he's pulled a lot of other youth off the street over there in the Bay City, too, that was lost. I mean, we were at the bottom. We couldn't, we didn't have no other way to look. And we looked up, and he took his mercy, and he pulled yeah. us out. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been serving God for about three months, and it's been, it's been just a blessing for all of us that, that have been serving God. There was so many of us lost, and uh, it's just a maze now. Bay City is just a peaceful town because the presence of God has been over it. What, what does it mean? What does it mean to be lost? Lost is mean when you're just traveling in complete darkness and blind by the devil. And to be the light is to take off your, your, your shades, your blackness, your darkness and, and spiritual, I'm speaking. And then looking up to the light and just realizing that he is your savior and he is the one. So you've only been saved, you've only been saved three months. Yes. What's these tattoos all about here? These are permanent tattoos, aren't they? Yes, sir. Yeah, was that what you got in the world? Yes, that's what I got in the world, and I wish I could take them off. Yeah. I mean, because now I'm serving the Almighty One, and I want to look my best for Him yeah. for when He comes for me. Yeah. You know. I noticed, I noticed when I asked you about those tattoos, you teared up. Why would you tear up? Because it hurts. Because I know that I know that He loves me and He forgives me, and He ain't gonna He ain't gonna worry about the tattoos because He's gonna take my soul. Yeah. And, but, <laughs> That's good. You know. It's so, it's so refreshing to see a young man just come out of the world only three months and he has regrets like that and it brings tears to your eyes. Son, I think that's wonderful. God's done a work of grace and y'all can see that. What's your name? Jesse Valeru. Jesse, God bless you, man. We're going to look to hear great things from you. Bay City, Texas. Bay City is in revival right now. All the churches are over there. Hi. Well, what, what's God doing for you? Well, I got saved 20 months ago. What is your name? My name's Lisa. You got saved 20 months ago? 20 months Where? ago. Where? Um, actually, two miles from here. Okay. I didn't even know God moved. Okay, that's fine. Um, what, what really struck me was um, <clears throat> I wanted to share what the Lord has healed in my life since I've been here. Um, I was diagnosed with clinical depression, and I was on lithium for eight years. Um, the Lord delivered me. I also um, suffered from panic attacks. I couldn't be in front of a crowd. I also... <laughs> I also had an illness called obsessive compulsive disorder, which um, a lot of people... Um, there have been like shows on 2020 about it. Some people have to wash their hands continuously. Some of them have to check things over and over. Basically, I couldn't hardly function unless I was on a very, very high dose of anaphronil, which is an antidepressant. And I was on that for eight years. Um, I was delivered from all of that a year and a half ago. I've been on no medication and I have no symptoms anymore. <laughs> uh, well, I, I was also delivered from an 18 year addiction to nicotine and I was a crack addict. An 18-year addiction to nicotine with no withdrawals and no cravings whatsoever. Um, well, your face looks bright and your eyes look real bright. It, it's all him. I'm in the school of ministry, too. So, um, I, I, I just, if, if anybody out there during the praise and worship had a thought, you know, of, oh, well, I know God heals um, cancer and God will you know, heal a broken bone or whatever. Anyone who's undergoing any kind of mental attack or is on any kind of medication and the doctor says you're going to have to be under this therapy forever because there's no cure, you meet Jesus and he will totally deliver you.
Hi. How you doing? God bless you. Tell us your name and where you're from. Mike Live and Good. I'm an evangelist from Illinois. Well, what's going on in Illinois? There are some pretty intense things happening. Pretty intense. We first came here about 19 months ago, 17, 18, 19 months ago, March of 96. I was totally unaware of what it was God was doing. I was preaching a meeting in Mississippi. Had a week off, and uh, somebody said, there's this revival going on in Pensacola that's nine months long. And I said, I can't get people to come five days. How are they doing nine months? <laughs> and in God's coincidences, I was going to be preaching in the Pascagoula area. Had a few days. So I said, well, let's go see what this is. Driving in on that Sunday morning, I said to my wife, I said, this is God. I need a fresh anointing. I need fresh direction. And I need fresh inspiration. David Womack was speaking that morning. At the close of the service, he said, I want all of those with back problems to come. And my back was hurting, and like a good preacher, I stayed in my seat. And then he said, I want all of those with knee problems to come. And he was batting two for two. So I thought, maybe I ought to go down there. Steve was fronting for Dave that morning, and he got to me. And I didn't have a badge. I didn't know there was a preacher's section. I didn't know anything. And Steve got to me and said, why are you here? The way my mind was working, I was thinking, that's a dumb question. He called for those of backs and knees. So I said, both my back and my knee. He said, no, you're not. He said, you're here for fresh anointing. <laughs> Wednesday night, the first revival service, we got to be in as far as the revival. Wednesday night, at the end of the service, after the, the prayer time, I, I stood about two and a half hours waiting to get prayed for. Steve came by after about two and a half hours and started to pray, and he stopped. And I know that normally prophecy is not given, but God gave him a word for me, and it said this. He said, there's a fresh anointing coming on you. I see you. You're in a river. You're lying on your back, you're laughing, you're floating, you're having a great time. A lot of work is getting done, but now you're not doing it. Now the current is. So there are people on the banks of the river, some are jealous, but you're saying, come on in, there's plenty. Oh, by the way, you're in the center of God's will, and God is going to use you to start this fire in many places. At that point, I melted. Unknown to me, my wife and my son had walked up behind me. They'd been struggling. God had blessed our ministry for 13 years. Greater doors that have had opened a year and a half in advance in the schedule. I hadn't worked a book a meeting in years, but we were tired. And we were at the point of saying, God, is it time to do something else? He said, you're in the center of God's will. I didn't feel anything, but I knew I'd heard from God. My wife never felt anything for two weeks. Now, tonight as she was prayed for, but we walked out of here the next Sunday and all heaven fell on that service. I came back the next week, canceled the next activity, said, I'm going back. Anybody with a badge, I got in front of them and said, pray for me. Before the week ended, you prayed for me one night and said almost the same thing that Steve had said. And the chaplain prayed one night, and again, the same message came through. I left here, went to the next revival, just in my devotions, the Spirit of God spoke. Very, very rarely will I say that I know that I know, but this is one of those times and God said it just a very few words. He said this, the day of fruitless meetings is over. In the last 18 months, God is my witness. Every revival has broken wide open. March, April, May, June, July, I couldn't believe what God was. Went to a church for 10 days. Was there a month? We came back here August last year, Spiritual Warfare Sunday. I came because my son said to me, at the end of our ministry camps last summer, I said to the boys, what do you want to do? He said, I want to go back to, Pens to Pensacola. So I came not to receive. I came because Scott wanted to come. God had an appointment for us again. On Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, I just trying to get out of the building. And somebody stopped me and said, I don't prophesy unless I've cleared with my pastor and he's left. But I think God's got something for me to tell you four times the same message. I'm a spiritual slow learner. It takes God over and over and over. The message was, you haven't seen anything yet. We left here. I drove from here to Illinois in shell shock. Things started breaking beyond anything I'd seen. I kept thinking, God, how can it get better? We walked into a church in northern Indiana. 
Two days of pinch hitting turned into 15 weeks. 500 people the altar for salvation. Every revival since then, the story's been the same. As with... I was with your friend Jack McIntosh in Terre Haute for seven weeks. About 250 people the altar for salvation. Went to Wisconsin for seven weeks. 350 submit the altar. It's been the most intense things that God has done within our lives. Um, every week I, I call Kerry to either ask him a question. So you better explain something to me that happened last night that I've never seen before or to report what we're seeing. But not just in the ministry on a personal level. I mentioned we felt nothing while we were being prayed for. And really, most of the time, I don't feel a lot when I'm being prayed for. But two mornings after we had been in the first service, we had picked up one of the worship tapes. We sat down for breakfast in the RV, and my wife said, oh, let me put that tape on. Before she could leave the tape deck and get back to the table, the Holy Spirit filled our RV, and for 45 minutes, we sat there and wept. In the last 18 months, God is my witness. I woke, I've awakened every morning for 18 months singing. Our life has been absolutely transformed. How did you feel before God touched you? What, tell, as a preacher, talk to another preacher out there and tell them what you were feeling. I grew up in a preacher's home. My mother, in fact, is in the auditorium tonight. I preached the gospel since I was 17 years of age on a very active basis. I love the Lord. People would say to us, Mike, we love it when you come to be with us, the anointing, the presence of God that is here, but I felt nothing. I felt dry on the inside. I'd go home after service and say, God, there's got to be more. Lord, people are getting saved and filled with the Spirit, but I don't sense anything taking place within my life. I don't feel anything happening. I love you. I love you, Lord, with all of my heart. I've, I've loved the Lord since... I received him at eight years of age in 1962. I said, I love you, Lord, but I don't feel anything taking place inside. There were moments, there was never any question in my mind that I would continue to serve the Lord, that I'd preach the gospel until Jesus comes. That was, that was not even open for discussion. But I had come to the point of simply saying, Lord, well, I, was, I would tell people this, the day of revival is over. Maybe in a few isolated places, God can do something, but I think it's too late for the nation. I think it's too late for us as a church. We're just... What do you say now? <laughs> we haven't seen anything yet. Yeah. <laughs> I believe that. Yeah. Well, listen. Every service is different. Like tonight, there's people here that we've never seen before, and there'll be people here tomorrow night and the next night. You know, they're here every night that we don't know. God evidently has somebody out there tonight sitting out there that you need to talk to just for a minute you're a preacher they're a preacher they're dry maybe they've thought about leaving the ministry maybe they've getting pressure from higher ups not to go after God what would you say to them take a minute and talk to them go after God we all get tired and we all get weary and I appreciate something Richard said last night about the last two weeks in the midst of revival being hellish. The visitation of God does not eliminate the attack of the enemy. I probably have experienced more opposition than I've ever experienced in my life in the last 18 months on a personal attack level. I tell people the difference now is I at least recognize it quicker, know what it is. Don't give up. You keep hanging on. God knows exactly where you're at. He knows how exactly to give you that appointment that you don't even know you have. Can. I walked into this place 18, 19 months ago. I did not have an idea in my mind that God had an appointment for me. I came to spend three or four days in a church in revival just to enjoy myself. But don't ever give up. God knows when your day of revival is scheduled. He knows when your appointment is at hand. You keep being faithful. There's, there is no secret to what it is that God has done. People have said to me, friends, I said, Mike, what are you doing different than what you used to? And I've said, nothing. I'm still preaching. I'm still praying. 
I'm not doing anything different. If there's been anything that mom and dad grilled into me, is you just be faithful. You do what God has called you to do and leave the results up to God. He will be faithful. Hi. And what is your name? Tanya. Tanya. And where are you from? Indiana. Indiana. What mm -hmm. part? Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Yeah, I know where it is. Sure. Um, I came here May the 5th with my mom. And which, actually, she flew me down. I wasn't saved or anything. We just came with two. Let's see. May the 5th of this year? Mm -hmm. How old are you? 22. 22. Mm -hmm. And um, we, I thought, okay, I'm going to go down to this revival one night and then act like I'm sick the rest of the night so I could like go out and party by myself or find somebody. Had you heard about the revival before you came? Yeah, but I didn't want anything to do with that. Why? I, I, because I was just, I didn't want anything to do with it. it. My mom and dad came down, they came home, and my dad was shaking. I was like, ugh. This makes me sick. I don't even want to be around this. You know, get out of my face when they were in there talking about it. So then my mom was like, well, we're, a few of us are going to go down. If you go, I'll pay your way. So I said, okay, well, but I didn't want to fly. But then I flew, flew anyways. But um, <laughs> so um, about a week before, I said, oh, well, I'm not going. I decided I don't want to go. And my mom said, please, just go. If you, will you just what is it about it that made you not want to come? I, I knew I was going to change, and I didn't want to. Yeah. <laughs> Now, that's what I was after right there. I, I didn't want to change, because I knew I would lose all my friends, yeah. friends, but. So. Well, when you saw your dad shaking, did you think it was real? I, well, my dad, yeah, because my dad, I used to, I remember just like being in my room and hearing him in there drinking and throwing stuff. So I knew when he got saved, that, that anything that he did was real, that it was going to be real. So, So you knew your and dad. I knew when I was a kid, all the stuff that I knew that he used to do, and then when he got saved, I knew that anything that happened to him had to be God to turn him around. But why did it make you sh sick to see him shake? Because I knew it was real. I thought, God, it is real. All this is real. So I came down and. It turned you off? It did real bad, yeah. <laughs> so um, so uh, a person that's, that God's dealing with can see somebody that's really under the power of God, and it turns them off. Oh, yeah. The reason why it turns them off is because you know it's so real. It's un it's unreal. It's unreal, unreal. So we just came to the prayer. <laughs> Let me get that right now. It's so real. It's unreal, it's right? Unreal, like unreal. You can't believe it. You just can't believe it. So we came to the prayer. I thought, okay, well I'm just gonna go to the revival one night with my mom and then just act like I'm sick or something, so I don't have to go. So I came to the prayer and all these people and I was set right over there. On Tuesday night. Yeah, just the prayer. It wasn't even anything. Well, it was something, but it wasn't the. <laughs> So, I mean, it was okay. something, but it wasn't the, you know, everything. So I just sat over there and just cried. I cried, I just bawled, and my mom just looked at me, and I just bawled. So I thought, okay, well, I'll go the next night. So we sat, we sat down here in the chairs, and then we had to move them. So I stood right back there, and I thought, they were doing the altar call. I thought, God, I wish I could go to the bathroom or something. I don't like this altar call. You're in the altar call? Oh, yeah. And then she started singing. What about the altar call bothered you? Well, because I knew there we go. I'm going to have to go up there. And I did it before. <laughs> I did it before when I was a kid, you know, I think, oh, they're going to think, there she goes again. There's, then I thought, but then it just came over to me, who cares? You don't worry about what they think. You worry about what I think. <laughs> so I, I just stood there praying, and I had that T-shirt on running in the mercy seat, but I wasn't about to. So that song started... <laughs> So that song started playing. I thought, oh. So I just prayed, Lord, okay, I'll go if my mom will take my hand. If my mom or somebody will just take my hand. You said what now? I'll just Come go here a minute. There if I don't have to go by myself. Just... You said I'll go if somebody will take my hand. Yeah. <laughs> how, many, how many other people do you think is like that out there in these services that says I'll go if somebody just reach out and take my hand? A lot. A lot. So I just said, please, God, I just don't want to go by myself. Please don't make me go by myself. So I just felt this hand, and I thought, thank you, Mom. Thank you, Mom. So I walked down there. That your mother? Oh, no, I don't guess. <laughs> Is your mother here? 
she's, I'm, I'm, I moved down because I don't go to the school of ministry. No. <laughs> She's, she's at home in Indiana. So I thought, okay. So I did all the praying and got everything out of me. And I went out there. I said, thank you, Mom. And she said, I didn't go up there. I go, I looked at my aunt. I said, thank you, Becky. She said, I didn't go up there. And then I said, thank you, Lord, for taking, walking me up there. And I just knew it was just a hand. It was just a hand. Somebody took your hand. Come, come up this way a little bit. For sure it was my mom. Because I prayed, Lord. So I took your hand led you up there. I mean, I felt, a, you know, like this. You didn't open your eyes? Oh, God, no. Because I was scared. <laughs> so I didn't want to. I was like, okay, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. So I just walked up there. And then once I got to the ground and started bawling and stuff and getting everything out. And then after a bit, I went and said, thanks, Mom. You know, and then she said, mm -mm, I didn't go with you. And I said, looked at my Aunt Becky. I said, thank you. I just couldn't go up there by myself. And then they said, I didn't go with you. And I said, well, you, somebody held my hand. So. Who do you think it was? Well, I know who it was. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's wonderful. So, you got saved. Oh, I did. And what's, what's happened since then? Well, I, we was at a dinner at my grandma's house, and my uncle was filling out these papers for the school. And he said, um, you, this is just not for boys. You can go to this school, too. You should apply. So I thought, well, I'd never, I wasn't good in high school because I was on drugs bad. So I, and I thought, well, Lord, if you want me to go to this school, you have to, get, you have to get me accepted. So I got all these recommendations, and it took forever to even get an acceptance. I kept calling them. I kept saying, did you get, did you get my recommendations yet? So um, then I got accepted, but then my brother... I have one brother, he's 18, and he woke up one morning, he was paralyzed from the knees down and the left side of his face. So I thought, God, what now? for the left side of his face was paralyzed and he was paralyzed from... He just woke up like that? Just, they don't know what it is. They have no idea. So I thought, that's just the devil. So I said, man, I won't go. I will not move to Florida. I will stay home, you know. He said, no, this is what you need to do because during all this, he got saved. Once he started getting sick, he knew the only way that he could get better is, because, is God. That's the only thing that would make him better. So he got saved. And then my other uncle got saved. So our whole family got saved. <laughs> so he's, he's still not completely better. But So we came down. Last Monday, last Wednesday, but I called home and my mom said, you know, that he woke up and he's, he had his feelings coming back on his left side. And he, because I pray all the time, Lord, please. And he said, um, he was just out of his mind because his, his head was hurting real bad and stuff. And he said, you know, it, I, I'm dying tonight. Tonight's the last night. And my mom said, well, what are you talking about? He said, would you better make sure everybody's over here at five because tonight's the last night. So um, they took him to the doctor and everything, but they just said it's all, he's getting the feelings back. So it just caused him to have a headache because he hadn't had any feelings on this side. So he just had a bad migraine. So I know the Lord's healing him. Yeah, so you, I'm standing. Welcome to Pensacola. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. How you doing? So what is your name? My name is Paul Stafford. Paul Stafford, where are you from? I'm from San Antonio, Texas. San Antonio. Mm -hmm. Well, what's, what's God done for you in the revival? Well, I had the privilege of being here in June. And I came, yes, with my wife. My brother had been coming, and he kept telling me I had to come. So uh, I finally came. And, uh, but, you know, I didn't really come wanting to come. I was, uh, I'm an associate pastor at a community Bible church. And uh, Why didn't you want to come? Well... <laughs> I think that man can answer that question. <laughs> I'm going to tell you because uh, I was in a backslidden condition. As an associate pastor. That's right. Mm -hmm, I sure was. And, and what, what was it about the revival that you didn't want to come? Well, I really, did, I really wanted to come just to see what was going on. That, I wanted to be a, a, a casual observer. That's why I came. But you didn't, want to, you didn't want to get, yeah, you didn't want to get involved. No. You didn't no. want God touching you. Right. I didn't think I did. Yeah. That's right. What changed your mind? Well, the power of the, of the Holy Spirit changed my mind. Yeah. How'd that happen? Well, we didn't get here until 7 o'clock. And uh, it was on a Friday night. This place was packed. 
And uh, we got stuck in, not in the cafeteria and not in the youth overflow room and not in the choir room. We were in one of these Sunday school rooms here in the back with one of these little TVs. And I told my wife, I could have done this at home. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, uh, but the, did, it, did it make you mad? No, I mean, I was interested. I, I, you know, I'm here. I came all this way. And uh, so I was going to sit here and enjoy it. I wasn't going to leave. So the praise came on and the Lord just began to touch me in praise and people, you know, there was about, oh, I guess 40 people in there, but everybody's praising the Lord like there was a, you know, like they were out here. And uh, we enjoyed the praise and, uh, and uh, Brother Hill began to preach and the Lord convicted me of, of three sins and uh, boy, he just nailed me to the wall. And Had you ever been nailed to the wall before? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Yes, sir. But, <laughs> but I had walked away from the Lord. I had let things... Now, I would never walked away from my... Did you know you were backslid? Mm. Would you just not admit it to yourself? I probably wouldn't admit it to myself. That's you right. You thought everything was fine. Oh, yeah, I'm a nice guy. In fact, I'm going to preach Sunday night, next Sunday night, Confessions of a Nice Guy. Yeah. like a title of a good book. Well, maybe so. I don't know. But I can tell you this, that what I'm not, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm ashamed of is that when I came here, um, the message was powerful for repentance, for backslidden anybody's, especially backslidden preachers, I guess. And uh, I was in the back room there, and I came around here, and God is so gracious because he was, I got more repentance after I left this revival. I mean, a work of God. See, repentance to me was always something in your mind. You know, they always say you just walk in one way and you just change and go the other way, you know. It's more than something in your mind. It's more than something in your, in your, in your will. It's a touch of God in your heart. Yeah. That's what it is. And, and I confess that I, I didn't do anything. God did it. I came down here. But let me tell you why. I, 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 I know that God wanted me to get up here tonight, and he did this. Because when I walked out of here that night, I said, Lord, if I ever get a chance to come back, I'm going to publicly confess my sin of being timid. I didn't run to the mercy seat. In fact, I shoved my wife in front of me. <laughs> Such a big man. And, 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 and I kind of hid behind people right down there on my face because I didn't want anybody to see me on camera. Well, okay. <laughs> I'm just telling you what it is. Well, this, this revival's meant a whole lot to me, and I pray for all three of you guys every day because I can tell you that uh, the Lord did a great work of repentance in my life. I, when you came to the altar, what did you feel? Well, I got cleaned up. How long did it take? Well, for the, let me just tell you, those three sins, I got cleaned up like that. But I walked out of here, and, and, and my, we walked out in the parking lot, and we saw all these cars, and no one was leaving. I said, come on, honey, let's go. And so we left, and we went back to the motel. I said, I don't know why all these people are sticking around here. And they were coming for prayer. I didn't know that. But, so we left. We went back to, to the uh, room, and I said, well, that was nice. So we got up the next morning, and we went to the beach. And I said, I'm not going back. I'm a real spiritual guy. <laughs> you weren't going back to revival? No. Why? I don't know. I just, you know, I'd had enough of, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate the work God had done in my life, but I didn't want to get too emotional. What, uh, what denomination are you? This is a non-denominational church. Non-denomination. Yeah. Well, let me tell you what happened. We were at the beach, and we were enjoying the beach. Had a wonderful time. It was beautiful. Everybody was, you know, it was, it was a nice nice deal on the beach but about four o'clock God just said you guys got to go back you got to go back so we 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 got we ran over to the motel got changed and we came here and got here around seven o'clock again Saturday night this was when he preached a fool's finale oh praise the Lord I got I got two of those tapes man I pass them out everywhere well I'm gonna tell you I was sitting over in the youth room and uh, <laughs> I couldn't get in here. I bet you're really blessed to be here tonight, aren't you? <laughs> oh, Lord, help me. I was sitting in the youth room, and uh, 
it, it just happened to be real loud. The sound system was real loud. So I was down front, and I said, honey, let's move farther back. And we moved back. And, and then we got in front of somebody who was really going into it, man. And I said, man, I can't take this. And so we moved back a little farther. You're sort of an honest guy, aren't you? Yeah. Sort of honest guy. So we're, we're, you know, we're like back up against the back wall. And uh, brother, you prophesied that night. And you said that uh, there was somebody here who'd been at the back of the house. And, uh, and uh, I'm not too bright, but my wife is. <laughs> And she punches me and says, you know, he, he's talking about you. I said, man, there's got to be 200 Assembly of God preachers that that's for, not me. But, you know, the Lord kept putting that on my heart. And I received it. It said I was going to have a fresh anointing to preach. One of the things that happened when I confessed my sins in the back room, I didn't even, I started confessing my sins in the back room before I hit the altar. But the Lord spoke to me, said he wanted me to preach. I've been a youth pastor for seven years, but I've been in administration and a family business, and I hadn't preached for about three years. And I really didn't think I was supposed to preach. Um, and God told me he wanted me to preach. And, and, and so, uh, that's a whole other story, but I said I would, but I'm going to tell you the next night when I came down, after receiving the word that the Lord had given you and the fool's finale, um, I, I got delivered from the spirit of religious pride. And that's what was keeping me from wanting to be here. Did you know you had it before you came here? I'm a nice guy. Didn't know I had it. So you don't push your wife out in front of you anymore? No, she's not even here. I'm down here just yeah. enjoying myself and my friend. <laughs> One more thing, if you don't mind. Yeah. You know, the Lord's done a real miracle in our church. Uh, the elders have uh, allowed me to preach every Sunday night. He gave me the service. And uh, we're, we are preaching on revival and we're praying for revival. We had our first service last Sunday night. And uh, we're expecting God to come in revival. And uh, we're, we're excited about what God's doing. So you're going to preach on what next week? Next week, I'm preaching on why we need revival. Amen. Yeah. And you're preaching on something about, um, you just named it a while ago, Confessions of a Fool? Oh, well, that's coming on, on September the 14th. Okay. No, you're saving that one. Yes, confession. Yeah, <laughs> Confessions of a Nice Guy. But I want to say to you that if it, when the Lord starts to move on your heart, pastors or people who are in church work, don't walk to the mercy seat. Run to the mercy seat. Run. Get all God has for you. Listen, one more thing. Take just a minute. Take just a minute and talk to preachers out there. Mm. Well, talk to the confessions of a nice guy. First of all, I never considered my, I was always a youth pastor, and, and you said preacher. I said, well, Lori, I'm not a preacher to my wife, and, and yet I, I've always loved to, to preach. But God never would open up the doors for a place for me to preach, and I always wondered why. And because uh, I've been to seminary, man. <laughs> but you know, I believe God's reserved uh, me to be able to preach on revival right in my church. You gonna preach repentance? Oh yeah, repentance, holiness, and evangelism. What would you do if you saw a man coming to the altar pushing his wife out in front of him? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I'd pray for him because God is so gracious. He was so patient and loving and kind with me in repentance. Like I say, he kept working repentance in my life. Just kept working it, working it, working. He was so good to me. What would you say to the man that's in the back of the house? Mm, in the back of the house? Well, hear from God. Hear from God, and if he speaks to you, go and do what he tells you to do. God bless you, man. Good to have you. Hi. Hey, how are you? Good. You got a testimony. Tell us your name. 
My name is Janet Webb, and I'm from Palm Forge United Methodist Church from Pensacola, Florida. And two weeks ago, we had a United Methodist Pastors Conference at our church. And we had like 85 United Methodist pastors here from all over the world. We have four from England, and the rest from, were from around the country. And so there's about 150 people there. There was pastors and laymen and just church staff. And it was Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And then Thursday night, we all came here. And so they could experience the revival for themselves. So Tuesday night, um, there is a pastor from the FSU Wesley Foundation, Tim Jones. And he preached a sermon on the rediscovery of repentance. And how if, um, he said, if you want revival to come in the United Methodist Church, you as pastors and as church lay people are going to have to get your lives right with God and get the secret sins out of your life. So that, because God's not going to use, you know, just unholy vessels, you know, and people that, you know, just go home and, you know, you may preach, you know, you need to repent, you need to get your life right with God, you need to be holy, but you go home you know, at night, you know, and you watch, you know, movies that Jesus would never watch, and he just, and all of a sudden, he got to Revelations 3.20, and he said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and sup with him, and he with me, and he said, and he had like four pages of notes still to go, and then he was going to give an altar call, but all of a sudden, he just started knocking on the pulpit, and as soon as he did that, just like all these pastors just went, to the altar and, and I was sitting in the front row and we have a really small church but like the altar pastors are like waiting in line to get into the altar and they're just crying and just wailing for the Lord and they just got right with God and oh <laughs> this one pastor, he confessed to his wife. His wife was there. He confessed to an eight-year adulterous affair with another lady, and the wife um, forgave him at the altar, and, you know, they're just doing cool now, and so then, <laughs> so then the next morning, this United Methodist speaker, his name is Terry Tickle, and he was coming to our church to speak on prayer, and he he was in the sleep inn, which is right by our church, and he met this Assembly God pastor in the lobby. And this Assembly God pastor, he's from this little um, city in Oklahoma, like 415 people. And he talked about how he'd been in revival for 11 months and how 700 people had come to his church and got saved. And I was like, 400 people population, 700 people, that's a lot of people. And so he was like, so Terry said, well, why don't you come over to our pastor's conference and talk to these people about your revival? And I guess he was just praying that our pastor would get, think it was okay for an assembly God to come in here and talk to the United Methodist Pastors Conference. But our pastor is like really cool and he's like dove into revival and he's baptized people by immersion for crying out loud and just, he's just totally... <laughs> And so, so he thought it was okay. And so this guy, suddenly got pastor, he gets up there and he starts sharing how this revival's in 11 months. And so Terry goes, if any of you United Meth if any of you pastors want to come up and be prayed by this assembly God preacher, just come to the altar. And they just went to the altar. And they got prayed for. And there's like all these United Methodists just like strolled out all over the floor. And it was so awesome. <laughs> So then, so then after that, um, he said, any of you who are like lay people, you're like church staff, like minister of music or anybody like that, to get in the aisles. And we only have like two rows of pews and then like a one inch aisle on each side and then a big aisle right here. And so like everybody just all of a sudden joined church staff and just got in the middle in the aisles. And, and um, there was like people, like little kids joining, you know, saying that they were church staff so they could get prayed for by the sky. And I mean, by this preacher. And so everybody's getting in the aisles. And um, so he just went by and started praying for people. And we were just like standing like sideways so, so we could fall in the pews because we didn't have catchers. Because that, <laughs> that thing, sort of thing, has never happened in our church before. So, and we had went to, um, before we had another kind of revival thing, we went to Walmart and got like these fabrics and the way we did it was me and my friend <laughs> me and my friend we just took the um 
the fabric and just rolled it out from like here down and we said we need 20 of these and that lady was she was like looking at us and she was like and but she wouldn't ask what we were doing it for and I really wanted to tell her so I was like I bet you're wondering why we you want us to buy this fabric well well we're fixing to have this revival and these people they're just going to be hit by the power of God and they're just going to go all over the floor <laughs> <laughs> and what did she say? <laughs> she said, okay, and she started cutting a little faster. <laughs> so anyway, so I played cloth attendant because that's what I do here at Revival, and we were, like, covering up all these Methodist pastors and stuff, and I was just like, praise God. And, and like, these people in our church that were working at the pastor's conference, they're, like, like half the church is my relatives. Like, like um... <laughs> No, I'm serious. I'm serious. They're like my uncles, you know, and their fathers were like the founding members of our church. Our church is like 100 years old. And, but this, my uncle, um, he, this, somebody got pastor pray for him and he went out on the floor. He like missed the pew and he was like rolling and like laughing in the spirit. And, and I asked him later, I said, um, Uncle Jim, how you doing? This is like 30 minutes, 45 minutes later. And he says, well, I just had this laughing problem, but other than that, I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> and he really didn't know what it was, and I was trying to explain to him how God had just touched him. And because we had prayed for like two years that God would restore his joy for the Lord and everything, and I was like, whoa, this is like my uncle and stuff. And so, <laughs> and so then, um, so after this, this, but right after this happened, the assembly God pastor left. So it was just like total visitation. And so after this happened, our whole pastor's conference schedule we just threw it out the window because we didn't know what to do next. So, <laughs> so we just kind of, we just kind of, okay, let's go take a break, I guess. So, but then, then that night, um, there's this guy and he's 27 years old and he's been working with our children and um, he's always had crutches and he's had cerebral palsy all his life. And this, the England pastor that was here, he started praying for this guy. And I guess he has the gift of healing. I guess it didn't matter because God was there. And he just laid, <laughs> he just laid his hands on this, on um, Danny is his name. And so he picked him up. And before the night was over, um, Danny had his hands on the England pastor. And they were walking across the um, church by himself. And um, the only thing is, is that, we're still praying for him because, um, you know, he's been in these crutches his whole life and he just doesn't have the faith to say, I don't need these anymore. But, I mean, just every day his legs just get stronger and stronger and his faith just gets stronger and stronger. And it's... <laughs> well, I take, it, I take it you really enjoyed that pastor's conference, didn't you? It, it was very good. And so then the next morning... <laughs> <laughs> How long was this pastor's conference? <laughs> it's only three days. So what day are we on now? <laughs> the third day. <laughs> and so then the, the, um, the next morning, um, my pastor gets up there and he's like, so how many of you guys are ready to go back to your churches? And like, everybody's like raising their hands. And they're like, yeah, we need to go back and preach repentance, you know? And all these pastors were getting up saying how they had gotten their lives right with God and how they're going to just go back and preach repentance. So then all us, 150 United Methodists, came to, to this church that night. And we all set up in that balcony section up there. And then, um, and it was so funny because we were like all dancing and jumping in the balcony up there and we kind of got in trouble because you're not supposed to because <laughs> you're not supposed to jump up there because it might fall on the people in the back <laughs> so then you told us to come down here so we just like all cleared out the balcony and like came down here and um but when we got back that night like we've been getting letters like come back from the lay people, not the pastors, but from the lay people saying how, what did y'all do to our pastor? He's like preaching like different sermons and you know, he's like anointed now and he's like, you know, Hallelujah. people are getting saved and stuff. <laughs> but um, we 
just had a really good time, and the four English pastors went back, and they're telling us how, you know, their sermons have changed and how. And next summer, our um, youth praise band is going back over to England to do like a, um, a praise and worship service kind of two-week thing over there. And it's so awesome because... Because John Wesley came over here from England, and that's the very city that we're going back to next summer. And he came over here, and he preached repentance, and he preached that you could be saved instantly. And that's how he was thrown out of the church, because he preached instant conversion. And he was thrown out of the church, but the reason he stuck with it, and he was so faithful, and he came over here, and he brought the fire to us, and that's why we're here, and that's why this pastor's conference was happening. And so we're just going to go over there and complete the circle and, and carry revival back to England. And we're so excited. And, um, and on behalf of my church, I'd just like to thank y'all so much for just inviting us Methodists in to just dive in. I got saved here June 30th of 1995. And um, it's just been so awesome. I'm in the school of ministry now, and um, I'm going to be a missionary. To, uh, and uh, and just thank you so much for just welcoming us and just letting us come here and act like crazy people. <laughs> well, I think it's great that you're in the Methodist Church and you still come to this revival and stay in your Methodist Church and your God's using you there. That's wonderful. And uh, you have a burden for the Methodist people. I'm. Even though I'm going to this school of ministry, I am going to be ordained as a Methodist because I feel like, you know, you know, this isn't this isn't a, a, a Pentecostal revival or a Swimming God revival. Right. This is my revival. This is a revival for me. come to pray and to see the Lord today for salvation from his hand for the healing of our land let us pray Let us pray, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, for we have placed all our hopes in Yeah. 
Yeah. 